Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming out. I, uh, I glanced at the registration list, too. And, uh, you know, uh, this being D.C., it's, it's not surprising that Kurt is right. There's a, there is a lot of uh, expertise in the room. And uh, this being D.C., uh, I'm sure you all think I mean you. Uh, so I, uh, I, won't, I won't disabuse you of that. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the paper uh, Chris Preble and I wrote, uh, Budgetary Savings from Military Restraint, which is outside. Uh, there we outline uh, 1.2 trillion cuts uh, in defense spending over 10 years uh, compared to current defense, uh, projected defense spending, which has changed a little, as we'll discuss. So it's, it will be a little off because of that. Um, and uh, we also give a rationale uh, for those cuts, what we call a strategy of restraint, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And then Chris is going to talk more about the detail of the cuts. So in this Congress, we have a, a political situation for the first time uh, in a while, since maybe the mid to late 90s, where defense budget cuts are likely. And, and we'll see what happens. Uh, we have the continuing resolution uh, expiring in March. So that's one defense budget. And then we have the next def defense budget right on its heels. So this will come up quick. We have Democrats uh, worried that spending restraint will uh, cut into the domestic spending. And we got Republicans that have been talking about uh, fiscal restraint so much that there's some, at least, are starting to take themselves seriously. Uh, seriously enough, at least, to reconsider the longstanding practice of considering the Pentagon to be an honorary member of the private sector, uh, to steal a line from the American Conservative magazine, and uh, therefore to scrutinize the $700 billion plus that, that we give it every year. And we've had uh, uh, Mitch McConnell and uh, Eric Cantor both say in the last couple weeks, uh, that defense spending ought to be on the table for any deficit reduction package. We have the Bowles-Simpson deficit reduction uh, plan that got 18 out of uh, uh, 11 out of 18 votes on, on the commission, uh, which calls for roughly 10 percent cuts in defense spending compared to FY 2010. Um, now, if you think, as Secretary Gates does, that that would uh, be catastrophic for the military, I note that it's, it's coming from a budget that's grown uh, 50 percent, even in adjusting for inflation, since 1998, leaving out the wars, uh, so that we now spend more on non-war defense spending than we did at the height of the Cold uh, War, at least in 1985, in the middle of the Reagan buildup, absent a Cold War-type enemy. The Secretary of Defense's uh, response to this has been, number one, to create an efficiency initiative. Uh, to try to make defense spending more productive, more tooth, less tail, less administration, more force structure, and thus less subject to pressure for savings. And uh, second, he, he recently announced uh, cuts of uh, $78 billion over five years from defense spending, uh, which is uh, contrary to a lot of uh, what we've been reading in the press, at least the headlines. It's, it's just a cut to planned spending, and, and defense spending will continue to growth, albeit at a slightly uh, s uh, uh, slower clip. But I, I think that despite uh, Gates's effort to try to slow things down, I think uh, the cuts are going to be uh, infectious and, and uh, his proposals will be insufficient and I think more likely. So what I want to talk about is, as I said, uh, uh, how to cut defense spending. And I, I think there are really three uh, approaches to doing it. The first is to do the same thing with less money and uh, say you're going to be more efficient. You get rid of waste and overhead and stuff like that. The second is the Nike way, uh, just do it, cut spending and hope that it, it triggers efficiency gains and a reprioritization of ambitions, uh, which is to say uh, strategic change. And the third is, is to start with strategy, to do less uh, and then try to save money uh, as a result. Now, uh, efficiency, the first method, is uh, uh, like children and federal holidays, something that pretty much everybody in Washington can be for, uh, which explains both why this is the most popular method and why it promises to save the least. Uh, that's because uh, what seems inefficient from a, from a cost benefit, benefit or auditor type, type standpoint is often politically efficient. The, uh, the uh, benefits are concentrated and the costs are generally diffuse. They come out as deficits or, or higher taxes. Um, so for me, the, the search for efficiency in the Pentagon is kind of like the search for booze in the movie The Untouchables. Um, there, there's a scene there where, where Malone, which is Sean Connery, um, and uh, Elliot Ness, Kevin Costner, are conduct what turns out to be their first successful liquor raid. And uh, they're in downtown Chicago across the street from a police station, and Malone looks at Ness um, I'm sorry, uh, Ness says to uh, Malone, looking at the uh, police station, he says, what, here? And uh, Malone says, Mr. Ness, everybody knows where the booze is. The problem isn't finding it. The problem is who wants to cross Capone. 
And so to me, the problem with saving money in government, including DOD, is not finding things to cut, but finding a way to cut them to overcome political opposition. And you see this uh, in lots of ways in, in recent uh, months, but you know, Joint Forces Command is an example. The secretary decided we ought to shutter that, and he had to do it over a big fight from uh, you know, half the Virginia or the whole Virginia uh, congressional delegation. In the end, uh, the White House had to compromise and say half the jobs from the command will remain. <coughs> And after that, it gets harder to cut things. So uh, one virtue of, of economic downturns is that, to some extent, it lessens this problem, that it, it concentrates the cost of spending by, by uh, forcing some choices. Uh, so the prospect of reduced spending or even slowed spending threatens uh, political truces that luxury bought. It heightens competition among programs. It sharpens debate. Uh, and that's sort of why we're here today. Austerity is a good auditor. Uh, and the same uh, effect holds within DOD, which is why the second way of cutting defense spending is not as crazy, the Nike just do it way, is not as crazy as it some, sometimes sounds. Um, reduced budgets will encourage uh, the services to find efficiencies themselves to protect their favored missions. So if you take the example of the, uh, the Joint Strike Fighter, the uh, short takeoff and vertical uh, uh, landing version, the Stovall version, JSFB, uh, the, the Navy is the one putting a lot of pressure on that program, uh, fighting against the Marines, and I think they're doing that because of pressure uh, on their budget, and you'll see more of that as, as uh, budgets get squeezed, and that's good news because that, that program's not necessary. The doctrinal basis for it is, is weak. If, 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 you know, it's, it's meant to fly off amphibious assault ships to support Marines ashore, but uh, we have carriers to do that. So if the Marines are doing something, uh, where they they uh, need air support, well, we're going to send a carrier. So why do we need uh, these uh, these aircraft? Um, now, the defense portion of of the Bull Simpson deficit reduction plan is is I think useful. It's it's helpful uh, politically, but it relies too much on on these methods, on these first two methods of cutting defense spending. Almost half its cuts come from some kind of um, overhead or administrative cuts, uh, and, and a lot of the rest is is savings to uh, personnel spending. Um, and uh, it says nothing beyond one sort of vague bullet point about, about strategy. So I think that's, that's bad policy and politics because the cuts are somewhat imaginary um, and uh, they can still get dinged for overburdening the force. So what we advocate is the uh, third or strategic path to cuts where you start with more modest defense goals uh, and uh, uh, that's what we call restraint. Uh, today in the United States, we have documents that call themselves defense strategy, but they're re really neither defense nor strategy. Uh, because of luxury, uh, we, we spend too much and choose too little. Uh, we sort of pile responsibilities and commitments on the military. And I, I think the recent or most recent quadrennial defense review is an example. It's more of a list of objectives and hopes uh, than a method of choosing among them, which is the point of strategy. So restraint means husbanding. American power and wealth rather than dissipating it by spreading promises and forces uh, willy-nilly, drawing us into conflicts that we could probably avoid. So there are sort of four uh, guiding uh, strategic insights that are in our paper uh, that, that, uh, that I, I'll mention real quick. The first is, is that we don't need to defend Europe from nothing and uh, Japan, South Korea, and others from dangers that they could afford to meet themselves. Uh, we committed to defend these nations when they were weaker and, uh, than enemies that we thought threatened us. And now they've uh, grown wealthy, and the new deal is that we agree to defend them and they agree to let us. And uh, I think that causes two problems, free riding and, and moral hazard. Free riding is where they spend less on defense uh, since we provide it. And uh, since money is fungible, that means we're effectively subsidizing their generous social welfare programs. And I, I don't blame them uh, for this, uh, just as I don't blame uh, you guys for uh, eating uh, the free sandwiches and knickknacks that the Cato Institute provided you. It's our fault. Um, and moral hazard is where our allies engage in, uh, in reckless behavior on the, under the assumption that we'll bail them out. And uh, you see this in, in lots of little ways and big ways. You see it in Japan, I think, with the leaders constantly going to this war uh, shrine uh, for war criminals that enrages the Chinese. You see it in Israel. Um, you see it in Taiwan and even in places like Georgia uh, that we've not formally agreed to defend, thankfully, but uh, thought maybe they had some sort of uh, defense guarantee from the United States. So we're providing disincentives for some, in some ways for accommodation among neighboring states. 
Uh, and I'd also add that letting our allies be their own first line of defense is not akin to renouncing them or abandoning geopolitics. I think we'd get along just fine with them, absent defense commitments, because we and they have lots of reasons to do so. And by the way, the, the, we don't save a lot of money by getting rid of bases in these countries. We save a lot of money by getting rid of commitments that we have to put force structure behind. The second insight that underlies our paper is that occupying and trying to fix failed states with ground forces is not a good counterterrorism method. Uh, one reason is that historically, occupation tends to cause terrorism against occupying countries, not prevent it. And second is that we've learned the hard way in recent years that we have, while we have the power to occupy weak states uh, at, at, for a while at great cost and blood and treasure, we lack the power to fix them uh, by organizing their politics, which is really what counterinsurgency doctrine is about. And I'd say, by the way, that skepticism about, about counterinsurgency really ought not to be an exclusive uh, province of the left. Um, you know, if you doubt that the federal government can reliably deliver the mail in Pittsburgh, I think you ought to doubt that it can deliver democracy to Mesopotamia or Afghanistan. Um, third, I, I think it's hubristic uh, and also uh, not particularly conservative to say that we alone in the United States uh, can provide international stability, that we're sort of the authors of history, uh, that uh, uh, through our overseas bases and naval patrols, we stabilize regions uh, and thus protect trade. Uh, I think uh, that overestimates both our contribution to, uh, to stability and underestimates the ability of other states to provide stability locally if we don't. And I think it also uh, overstates the degree to which trade is brittle. Uh, and dependent on, on military deployments. And I'm happy to elaborate on that point, which is a rather es esoteric one uh, in the Q&A. Finally, uh, sort of the dirty secret, I think, of American defense politics is that we're pretty safe here in the United States um, before we send one, uh, one soldier abroad because of wealth, uh, because of geography and technology, starting with uh, nukes. Um, what passes for enemies now uh, is uh, really quite limited compared to the past, compared to other great powers. Uh, and, and I think that's why people, uh, hawks, uh, resort to a lot of arguments about the need to, for the United States to create global stability. We've sort of run out of uh, threats that we can uh, credibly inflate enough to justify our whole military budget using normal arguments. Um, and again, I'm not going to run through all the uh, different countries in the world that we're told we're supposed to worry about to justify our defense budget, but it's, it's in our paper, and I'm certainly happy to talk about it more. I'll just say that as to the, the constellation of, of uh, jihadists and their fellow travelers that we refer to as al-Qaeda, well, uh, there's certainly a problem, but I think hardly an existential threat uh, worthy of, of comparison to Nazi Germany or uh, continuous warfare. I think they're instead best dealt with uh, by intelligence policing and, and where the military is used, uh, cheap uh, niche capability, uh, you know, drones, uh, 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 surveillance technology, of course, and special operations forces, not the Army, not the Navy, not the Air Force. Um, so to sort of finish up, um, I, I think, you know, we get, we get dinged a lot. People say this is uh, isolationist and an abandonment of our, uh, our duty, our moral duty to spread liberalism. So I just want to address that in a couple words before I finish. I, I'm, I'm for an ethic of, of responsibility that, that gives pride of place to possible goods at home rather than tracing, uh, chasing ideological dreams abroad. I think our respons responsibilities start here. Um, I, I, I will say uh, for Cato, we're, we're not isolationists. We want freer trade. We want diplomacy. We want more immigration. Uh, we don't want to plan for no wars. We want to plan for fewer. Um, and, and though I'm more skeptical than most people about the virtues of hegemony, uh, I will say that, that with the military that we'd like to have, uh, we'd still have military preeminence by a mile. Um, it would require the American taxpayer to pay uh, 35 or 40 percent of world military spending instead of half. Um, and uh, I just say that I think that's only isolationist compared to a very bloated idea of what our security requires. And uh, I'm sort of with uh, Walter Lippmann, who, uh, who said he was happy to be called an isolationist compared to the people who thought they could run the world. So uh, I'll leave it there and, and look forward to questions. <laughs>